Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. On behalf of the Logistics Support Activity Commander, Colonel Scott J. Lafredo, welcome to the 2016 LOXA Luncheon and Observance of Black History Month. Black history is a time to reflect on the contributions that African Americans make and have made to American society and to recognize the numerous struggles that define the African American experience in America. Much of Black History Month, understandably, focuses on well-known movements, incidents, and individuals to tell the story. However, what is oftentimes overlooked is the role played by free speech and free expression in civil rights, politics, art, and entertainment and shaping of black history, and by extension, American history. We are honored to have many distinguished guests with us in the audience today, and it is my pleasure to introduce them. We would especially like to welcome Congresswoman Terry A. Sewell, representative to Alabama's 7th District, Mrs. Linda Vi, the Army Material Command, Commanding General's wife, Mr. Troy Trulock, Mayor of Madison, Mr. Bob Harrison, Madison County Commissioner, District 6, Mr. Will Culver, President, Huntsville City Council, Dr. Richard Showers, Senior, Huntsville City Council, District 1, and Dr. Daniel Wims, the Alabama A&M Provost. We thank you for taking time out of your day to join us. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my pleasure to welcome the host for today's event, the Logistics Support Activity Commander, Colonel Scott J. Lafredo. For everyone in the room today, thank you very much for attending. Thank you for participating in LOGS's Black History Month Luncheon uh, for 2016. Today's a great day for me. It's very humbling, actually, to be here today as the commander of LOGSA. Um, I would like to first thank very much Congresswoman Sewell for attending today. Um, I know that we are humbled for your presence. Uh, Ms. Lynn Devai, the wife of the AMC commander, thank you again for coming to our event today. Uh, humbled because of the fact that there's a great turnout. Humbled for the fact that we had great employees in our command that put this on. So I'll go off a of script here. Uh, Ms. Mildred Blackshear, please can you stand? I know you hate when I do this. And Mr. Ike Wilder, Ike, if you can stand, please, as well. These two individuals were the reason why this will be a success today. They are um, instrumental in promoting events such as this. They're valued members of the command. And uh, Mildred is also in charge of the future of LOGSA. And so through her vision and through her expertise, I know she hates when I do this, um, we will be a better command for AMC and a better command for Huntsville because of her involvement. So I tell you today, enjoy yourself. Um, again, thank you for being here. I'm humbled by the great turnout, and I'm looking forward to a great presentation. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, it is an honor to introduce the Alabama A&M Provost, Dr. Daniel Wims. Thank you, ma'am. As uh, professors, we are trained to speak in 55-minute blocks. <laughs> but I think we'll forego that today and just say to our speaker, Congresswoman Sewell, to the representatives of Army Material Command, your invited guests and affiliate organizations, uh, we welcome you to this magnificent campus that sits majestically in the mighty city of Huntsville. Uh, on behalf of our Board of Trustees, the 11th President of Alabama a &M, Dr. Andrew Eugenie Jr., the over 5,700 students, about 1,200 faculty and staff, 20,000 plus alums that we have addresses for. We welcome you, we greet you, and. Uh, on behalf of all of our friends and members of the Bulldog Nation, we wish you a wonderful program and Black History Month. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Ladies and gentlemen, now to present a musical selection, the Black History Ensemble.
grounds, sites of American heroes. How appropriate for today's guest. Ladies and gentlemen, we're, for, we're in for a special message today because our speaker hails from hallowed grounds, the historic Selma, Alabama, where just the mention, just the mention of the name invokes many different kinds of emotions for African Americans actually emotions for all of us, but primarily a feeling of pride for those brave souls that provided the compass for our continuous journey to equality for all. I offer an abbreviated biography for our speaker. Our speaker is serving her third term as the U.S. Representative of Alabama's 7th Congressional District. She is one of the first women elected to Congress from Alabama in her own right. 
and is the first black woman to ever serve in the Alabama congressional delegation. Our speaker sits on the elite House Committee on Financial Services and the distinguished House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence, charged with the oversight of our national security. She is the ranking member of the subcommittee on the Department of Defense Intelligence and Overhead Architecture, a key submit subcommittee on the House Permanent Select Committee on Intelligence. In her short term in Congress, our speaker has had, held several leadership positions, including freshman class president of the 112th Congress. This term, she was selected by Democratic leadership to serve as chief deputy whip and sits on the prestigious steering and policy committee, which sets the policy direction of the Democratic caucus. To be selected by Steny Hoyer, one of the most notable and serious members of Congress <coughs> to serve in this position is certainly very noteworthy of the confidence shown, <coughs> shown her as such a young member of Congress. Whips help mold legislation, they write the legislation in such a way that members would not only support the legislation, but the whip must also persuade members to vote for that legislation after it's passed. What a responsibility. <laughs> and uh, we're extremely proud that you're in that position. She is also a member of the Congressional Black Caucus. And on a personal note, her parents were committed to improving the lives of others. As a coach, her father molded the lives of children his entire career. And her mother blazed the trails on many, many levels. On the municipal level, she became the first African-American woman elected to the Selma City Council, where she served with distinction for several years. She served as the regional director and supreme grammatist for the prestigious Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated. And on the national level, she served as an officer with women in municipal government in the National League of Cities. So as elders, as our elders would say, you come from good stock. <laughs> And so it was only, only, it was just destined for you to serve your country and our nation. She is a proud product of Alabama's rural black belt. Our speaker was the first black valedictorian of the Selma High School. She is an honors graduate of Princeton University and Oxford University in England and received her Juris Doctorate degree from Harvard Law School. Ladies and gentlemen, it is my honor and pleasure to present the United States Congresswoman from the 7th Congressional District, Terry Sewell. Well, welcome everyone. This is indeed an honor for me. Uh, let me start by saying uh, thank you to uh, Colonel um, uh, Lofredo. Thank you very much uh, to Mrs. Vi, who's here. Uh, please tell the general that we um, are so proud of his leadership and all that he's doing for this nation. I also want to thank uh, Mrs. Hugeni for being here and um, Provost uh, Wim for letting, uh, letting us have this wonderful venue. You know, every time I come to the Hill, I am reminiscent of the fact that my mom and dad met uh, right on the hill, uh, working as uh, teachers, my dad a coach, my mom a librarian, at council training school. And uh, so they bought their first house here, they had their first child here, thank you very much. Um, and so Huntsville is like coming home, so thank you for the opportunity to do that. I know I, it's been a, a, a long time coming, so I thank you for your patience. Uh, you and Mildred, I wanna thank you for your leadership in putting this program together. Uh, it's always a pleasure for me to come home, but it's especially a pleasure to be your speaker for Black History Month. You know, I know you've heard that Black History Month shouldn't just be celebrated in February, it should be celebrated 365 days of the year, and that is so true. Um, but I also think that it is an opportunity every year for this nation to pause and pay honor and tribute to the many contributions that African Americans have made um, in every field, in every walk of life. I like to say that black history is a continuum. 
It is each and every one of the African Americans who take a step forward in a positive way in whatever field they choose to. Um, and so it's a continuum, and I know I am so honored to have the opportunity uh, to walk the halls of Congress, but I also know that uh, that opportunity comes with a cost. And others paid that cost. I get to walk the halls of Congress, but there were four little girls that were bombed in 1963 in 16th Street Baptist Church who didn't get to live to reach their full potential. So those of us that are blessed to have had that opportunity owe it to those little girls and to so many who have fought the good fight that we um, do what we do every day to move the needle forward in a positive way. And I know that that's very hard in Congress because sometimes we're just a little bit dysfunctional. <laughs> just a little bit. Well, this year's theme for black history is hollowed ground. And as the representative of the district, which includes Birmingham and Tuscaloosa and Montgomery and my hometown of Selma, I believe that we in the 7th Congressional District are ground zero for hollowed ground. Ground zero for the sites and major events that have changed America for the positive in the area of civil rights and voting rights. And I take serious my role as inheritor of that legacy and as a representative from this district, preserver of that legacy. We should never forget what happened in the state of Alabama in the 50s and 60s. We should never forget what happened to the Scottsboro boys. We should never forget what happened to those four little girls and Bloody Sunday. And part of my job uh, in representing the 7th District is to represent those constituents to the best of my ability currently, but also to preserve that heritage and that legacy for future generations. To use that as an opportunity, a launching pad, if you will, to promote tourism to those areas and hopefully economic revitalization. And that comes hard these days when Congress is constantly at battle over the budget. I mean, first of all, I've been there five years and we've never passed a budget. That in and of itself says a lot about what we are, how dysfunctional um, Congress is. Um, but I have to tell you that we fight every day for how we divide that limited pie that is America. Um, you know, we have limited resources and how we divide that pie, how we spend our money, how we choose to spend, tells us a lot about what we value in life. Right? Um, and so it's refreshing to know that, um, you know, Colonel Lafredo, the defense, military, that is truly bipartisan. And that's a good thing because our national security should be bipartisan. But we fight on many fronts, be it um, to preserve Head Start, to, to make sure that our veterans uh, get the services that they have earned the right to get. And so we, we fight every day about really important issues, um, but my concern is that we don't find resolution often. And the people who lose when no resolution is found is the American people, right? And I'm here to tell you on this Black History Month celebration that if we, the people, do not reclaim the federal government for ourselves, we will lose it. What do I mean by that? You know, you elect us to come to Washington. And so you, the electorate, must make it okay to compromise. I think that what we're seeing in the presidential election is the frustration of the American public on both sides of the aisle. And so we're seeing extremism to the far left, to the far right, really seize the day. And I'm telling you, you govern somewhere in the middle. You know, Commissioner Harrison, I like, what do they say? When you're running for something, it's like poetry, but when you're trying to govern, it's like prose. <laughs> and that's because it's somewhere in the middle. It's somewhere in the middle. Not on either extreme, but in the middle. So we have a lot to be thankful for in this great country. I just hope that you as an electorate will remember that you, you really control the temper and 
uh, tone of Congress by electing officials who you hope will have your best interests at heart. But we should be more concerned about getting you all jobs, making sure you all keep your jobs, than worried about ourselves keeping our jobs, right? And I think that, um, you know, I'm going to get off my soapbox about this, but, you know, one of the, one of the advantages of, this, uh, of being in this position is that you have the opportunity to, or the platform to, really promote and advocate the change you want to see, not only in your district, but in America. And I would be remiss if I didn't say that I hope that Americans reclaim Congress for Americans and make it okay for the far left to meet in the middle, for the far right to meet in the middle. You gotta want, you have to elect people who understand the art of compromise. Better to be at the table and get a little bit of something than to be outside the room screaming and yelling or building fences. <laughs> right? Better to be inside the room. So when I think about hollowed ground, I think about uh, the district that I have the, the, pr the pleasure of, um, of representing. I think about all of the hollowed grounds that are in this district, uh, from the Edmund Pettus Bridge to Dexter Avenue Church, where Martin Luther King got his start, and where when you think about the proximity of that little church, and it, 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 it stares straight at the Alabama Capitol. A, th a, a throne's uh, throw away, a stone's throw away. And you think about the history that lies there. And if these sites could talk, if those hollowed grounds could talk, what a story they would tell. You know, the Negro National Anthem says it best. Stony the road we trod, bitter the chastening rod, felt in days when hope unborn had died, yet with a steady beat have not our weary feet come to this place for which our fathers sighed. The words of the Negro National Anthem speaks of the trials and tribulations of the African American people. We are the inheritors, I would submit, of an awesome legacy. The plight of African Americans in, a, in this country has always been one of resilience. We've been moving from struggle to redemption through resilience in every time and point in this country. And there's no substitute for knowing your history because if you don't know your history, you're doomed to repeat the errors of the past. And black history must take its rightful place in world history. You know, if we don't tell our stories, other people will tell our stories. And they may not tell it the way we would tell it, right? They may not get it right. And I have to tell my, uh, my constituents, black and white, that we have to embrace our history in Alabama, put it in its proper context, but claim it for the fact that we, in America, in the South, in Alabama, that the movement that began here changed this country, made this country live up to its ideals of democracy and equality and justice for all. And for that, it led to a human right revolution, if you will, that is worldwide. Civil rights, human rights, voting rights. It's so important that we claim our history, and for good and for bad, but not only claim it, but remember to move it forward in a positive way. So preserving our legacy uh, in many ways is also admitting that there's still many more hollowed grounds to come, right? We, we have to forge ahead and find new and fresher grounds because our work is not done. And so I thought I'd talk a little bit about Beyond the Bridge. You know, we celebrated uh, last year the 50th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March. And I don't know how many of you were here, were there in Selma on March 7th, uh, 2015, but our president, it was a beautiful day. And I got to welcome over 100 members of Congress, both Republican and Democrat, to my hometown. Two presidents, President Bush uh, and President Obama. Two first ladies, Laura and Michelle. Uh, one first grandmother, 
<laughs> Mrs. Obama's uh, uh, mother, Ms. Robinson, and two, uh, you know, first children. And it was a great and glorious day. Uh, but it's not just about giving a speech, right? It's not just about walking across that bridge one time. To me, it's about what is your commitment, ongoing commitment, to the struggles that those great events symbolize. We have so much unfinished business in civil rights. And I am reminded often that, you know, history is a continuum, and so it's not stagnant, but we have to make our own history. We, the generation that has benefited from the civil rights movement, owe it to the past generation to play it forward, if you will. And how we choose to do that, well, there's lots of arenas one can do. I often tell young folks, there's no greater sacrifice than to give of yourself for others and that everyone should try to fulfill their obligation to being on this great earth by public service. It was uh, Shirley Chisholm who said that public service is the rent we pay for the privilege of living on this earth. What a great saying. And it's so true. And so how do we get our young folks politically involved? How do we engage in our communities in a way that will move this needle forward. Because there is a lot of unfinished business. I can't imagine that in 2015 you would have um, the tragedy at Mother Emanuel that harkens you back to what happened in the 16th Street Baptist Church, right? I mean, 50 years has passed, but yet hatred, intolerance still exists in this world. And as long as we have those kinds of battles, we'll have the need for a John Lewis, a modern day Amelia Boynton, a modern day Rosa Parks. So there's lots of unfinished business. I'm reminded of the fact that I had as my State of the Union guest last year, Amelia Boynton, who was 104 years old. And if you saw the movie Selma, she was the one who wore the cat-eyed glasses, who told Coretta Scott King that she was prepared that she was a descendant of kings and queens, and that the blood that flowed through her veins was royal blood. So she was prepared. Oh, I love that. So this woman is now, well, she's deceased now, but last year she was 104 years old, and I got to take her to the State of the Union. And I got to introduce her to the first African-American president of the United States. And as we waited in that little vestibule for him to come in to greet her before he gave his speech, there were lots of cabinet members that passed by. And to, to a person, they all said the same thing. Oh, Miss Boynton, you know, Secretary Castro, I stand on your shoulders. Um, you know, Secretary uh, uh, Fox of, of Transportation, I, I stand on your shoulders. And then along came Eric Holder, who at the time was still our Attorney General. And he kneeled down to her and he said, Mrs. Boynton, you know, I, I, I stand on your shoulders. And she looked up at him and the rest of the room and she said, get off my shoulders. <laughs> there is plenty of work to do. Do your own work is what she said. Right? Do your own work. So there's plenty of work to be done. What will we, the inheritors of this great legacy, do to further that legacy? Well, I can tell you that uh, I'm looking forward to next week. Next week will be the week when we commemorate um, and give the foot soldiers of the Selma to Montgomery March the highest civilian honor Congress can give, which is a Congressional Gold Medal. That ceremony will take place in our nation's capital next week, and I'm, 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 I'm ecstatic about it. I'm so excited. It was a bill that passed through Congress that I sponsored that was signed into law by the President of the United States while he was on Air Force One, landing into Craig Air Force B Base in Selma, Alabama. I mean, it doesn't get any better than that, does it? I mean, from where I stand. What? And who would have thunk that a little black girl from Selma would grow up in a church, Brown Chapel, and grow up with the knowledge that of the importance of her church and her town to a movement, and then one day become that member of Congress who just so happens to be that member of Congress during the 50th anniversary of the Selma to Montgomery March. 
And as many of you know, I had the opportunity to go to law school with the president. And I am, it is not lost on me that this is not about me. It's not about him, right? It is really about a collective continuum of hard work by African Americans and good white folks and good folks generally who really have taken the mantle of the Bible, if you will, and to really understand the importance of not seeing color or religion, but seeing people's character, of knowing that America is the land of plenty, plenty, the land of the American dream. And who among the Americans have really put to, to a test the American dream like the African American plight in America? We have, we test it, and we continue to test it. I think about the Black Lives Matter movement and I am in awe of the activism of our young folks. But we have to tailor that activism, not just to remove a symbol like the Confederate flag. Now, that should have been removed a long time ago, right? I'm glad, I'm glad Nikki Haley removed it, that's great. But if we could channel all of that energy into passing comprehensive uh, criminal justice reform, well, that'd be great. If we could channel that energy into passing um, the re restoration of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, our demand has to be, to me, more than just about the movement. It has to be about the greater community and how we can all benefit from that energy. It's not displaced, but it is, I think, we settled for the removing a flag that should have been gone a long time ago when we really could have been demanding real change in the way of criminal justice reform, voting rights reform, immigration reform. I mean, there's just so much legislation that we could have done. Um, but I, I, I know that in our struggle for, to continue the, the, the fight that others led, we get weary. And in fact, I can tell you that as a member of Congress, there are times when I am downright tired. When the partisan bickering and the gridlock is so real, so palatable, that it immobilizes us as individual lawmakers. And when you represent a district that is your home district, when your mama is your constituent, constantly reminding you, because y'all who know Nancy know that she constantly reminds me <laughs> of what's at stake. Right? You don't have time to be tired, she tells me. <laughs> and you know, when I feel really tired, I have to go through that, to, to that glorious uh, photo in the nation's capital of the only African-American woman in our nation's capital. And that's the photo of the first African-American woman to walk the halls of Congress, Shirley Chisholm. And I have to go up to that photo. And I just stare at her. And I can tell you that in looking in her eyes as she's literally standing there unbought and unbossed, if you, I don't know if you've seen that photo of her, but it's fabulous, a wonderful painting of her. I am reminded that I should be no ways tired, that she fought the fight. I can't imagine being the first one in 1969, can you? I, I can't. And so I get a little pep in my step when I pass that photo. I, look, I get a little stride in my glide, right? Because I realize that I've had it easy compared to her. So I should be no ways tired. And that the battle of my generation is truly an economic one. But we can't forget the political battle because there's always, progress is always elusive. We have to constantly be vigilant. We're always one Supreme Court justice away from rolling back that progress, always. So we have to be ever vigilant. And our vote is our voice. That is the way we, in a democracy, exercises our voice, is through voting. And so while it's wonderful that we're going to give a medal next week to our foot soldiers, and I'm looking forward to that, there's something every one of us can do. The best tribute that we can give to those foot soldiers is remembering to vote in every election, local, state, and federal. Whether it's raining outside or not, whether it's snowing, sleet, we should be standing in line. That's the least that we could do, right? 
So we all have it within our power to pay it forward, to actually give honor and tribute to that legacy by doing something that is the very basis of our democracy. So I hope that you will remember that on those days that you're a little too tired to go out and cast your ballot. You need to remember that Selma is now. That Selma wasn't just 50 years ago. That the struggles that are uh, in, in our time sometimes reflect the very base of the struggles that our ancestors fought. I, I know I said jokingly about the fence, but it's disturbing to me in America that we would prop up a candidate who literally wants to build a wall to keep people out, people who ain't but a few shades lighter than me. And it's just, to me, unfathomable that in this day and age, we would still have the xenophobia, the intolerance of otherness, the fear and people capitalize on that fear. But where are the righteous? Where are the good God-fearing folks who know that we should stand on faith? We should see, come on, we should. That we, I'm not saying that there are not reasons for us to fear, but we have to face our fear. You know, I think about what happened in San Bernardino, and I think about what happened in Mother Emanuel, and the only difference between what happened today or you know, this gener during, this, uh, during our lifetime and what happened 50 years ago is just the place and circumstance. I mean, I, I have Muslim American friends who literally live in fear in America. There's a lot of unfinished work that can be done. And I really hope that we um, who are blessed, and everyone in this room is blessed, that we who are blessed are a blessing to others. My mother has a saying, bloom where you're planted. Bloom where you're planted. You know, I'm not asking for everyone to go out and run for uh, an elective office. But I am saying that we all have our own space that we can make a difference in. Be it our school, our church, our workplace, where we can make a difference. So in this Black History Month, I want to leave you with the thought that there is unfinished business. But that business is our business collectively, black and white. Just like the history of African Americans in America is really about American history. We have to embrace it for good and bad and realize that just because there's the first this, first African American president, you know, I know for a fact that um, I wasn't the first person from Alabama that deserved to be a member of Congress who's African American and a woman. In fact, Nancy Sewell is a real congresswoman from the state of Alabama, my mother. <laughs> Y'all who know that know that's true. But I can tell you that those of us who drink deep from wells that we did not dig must make sure that those wells run plentiful for those behind us. Right? So it's not enough to be the first this, the first that. The real test of America is when we're no longer counting whether it's the first this or the first that. When there's so many folks doing so many different things and so many levels of, uh, of government and of, this, of, of our communities that we don't even keep track. Now, that's not to say that we shouldn't also take pride in that which is African American and in, in our history. In fact, to me, black history is, is American history, is world history, but I am so proud of the legacy that was left to me. And even in those dark days when I don't think I can go any further, I have a deep reservoir of amazing people who preceded me through much harder condition, much bigger barriers, and still somehow they achieved. It makes our plight a lot better to deal with when we put it into perspective of, of, of a fight that is really global. 
So I'm going to stop preaching, uh, but in, before I go, I want to share with you my final thought. You know, our elders are so wise, and oftentimes it is out of the mouth of our elders that words of wisdom, that, that sage advice uh, is memorialized and remembered. So I hearken back to uh, the State of the Union last year when Miss Amelia was sitting in her wheelchair and um, finally the president walks into that little vestibule. Now she has had all of us in stitches about talking about get off her shoulders, do your work. And when, that, when President Obama walked in, he says, I understand that there's a special guest and everybody kind of parted the sea so that he could walk up to her. He kneeled down beside her um, and she's in a wheelchair, she's 104 years old, uh, but spry, I mean, all, all there. And he says to her, Mrs. Boynton, you know, to say thank you isn't enough. I, I get to be the President of the United States and I get to give the speech in a few minutes as the President of the United States of America. And I owe it to your courage, the courage of those foot soldiers like yourself, the bravery what faith you must have had to have that bravery. And she looked up at him with these eyes that were, all of us were in tears, so clear. And she said, now you make it a good one. <laughs> she was basically saying, we done waited all this time, I done been beaten on a bridge for you to give this speech, and it needs to be a good speech. <laughs> but what a great model for all of us. We who are the beneficiaries of a great legacy, owe it to our ancestors, owe it to those before us to make it a good one. Whether it's that job interview, that paper you're about to write, that, that project you're about to turn in, we should make it a good one. It's not enough that it's average. It should be really good. It should be really good. So as you're going back to your places of employment, I hope that you will remember that black history is American history is world history. I hope that you will remember that we have unfinished business and we can do our own work. There's lots of work to be done. And I hope that you will remember that we owe it to those before us to make each and every day a good one. Thank you. Thank you, Congresswoman Sewell. At this time, we have a few guests who would like to make some brief presentations and remarks. On behalf of the Logistics Support Activity, please welcome Mrs. Lasagna Cooper and Mr. Ike Wilder. On behalf of Epsilon Gamma Omega Chapter, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Incorporated President Dr. Wilma J. Ruffin. My sword. <laughs> <laughs> I see you don't want to talk to that. I will. Thank you, sir. On behalf of Rogue High Omega Chapter, Alpha Kappa Alpha Sorority Incorporated, Mrs. Cheryl Johnson. No. 
On behalf of the Links of Greater Huntsville, the President, Dr. Jeanette Jones, and chapter members are here in support of Congresswoman Sewell. We would like to welcome Councilman Culver, President of Huntsville City Council. Well, I'm not uh, President uh, Culver. <laughs> it is a delight, though, uh, for us on behalf stop of our shot. mayor. I can't, I gotta stop you right here because um, you are a legend. <laughs> and I just wanna say thank you. You know, I grew up in uh, Selma, but I claim Huntsville. And it seems like every time I would ever come to Huntsville, Alabama, you were always there. So thank you, sir. Uh, on behalf of our mayor, uh, the other three council members, uh, the elected officials that's at the table where we were, uh, Bob Harrison, uh, commissioner for our city, uh, mayor, True Lock, uh, and uh, the wife of my friend and brother, uh, Dennis Vile, Colonel Dennis Vile, General. Okay. And certainly to the Colonel, Alice uh, uh, Sams, our past uh, NAACP president. To all of you, it is just a delight uh, to be here and to be invited uh, to present to our speaker an honorary citizen certificate. And I'm going to ask uh, my president, uh, Will Cover, if he would come and present this on behalf of the city of Huntsville. And thank you, Dr. Showers. And I must tell this quick story. Uh, Dr. Showers, who's currently president pro tem, he has served as the first African-American president of this council. In fact, he has been the first African-American elected to the city council since Reconstruction in 1907. <laughs> and I want you to know that after I begged him and pleaded with him and begged him, he says, boy, I'm gonna let you be president. <laughs> And here I am. So I want you to know that he's got my back, I've got his back, Amen. and together we have your back. Yay. And to Congresswoman Sewell, I cannot tell you what an honor and a privilege it is to be in your presence here today on this very, very auspicious occasion. And I feel that what we are about to do here is appropriate in that your mom and dad met here in Huntsville, that you were born here in Huntsville. So I'm gonna share this certificate to the public, with the public here. It says, <laughs> be it hereby known <laughs> that by the authority vested in the City Council of the City of Huntsville, Alabama, Congresswoman Terry Sewell, representing Alabama 7th District, has been made an honorary citizen of Huntsville, Alabama Yay. on this, the 16th day of February, 2016. Signed by Mayor Tommy Battle and all of the council members. So having said that, Congresswoman Sewell, Dr. Showers, and myself, Commissioner Bob Harrison, Mayor Troy Trulock, and all of the other elected officials. I know we have some folks that are running. Uh, we're going to ask for your vote and help right now. Thank you. I will cherish this. Thank you so much. Thank you all so much. Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back for another, another musical selection, the Black History Ensemble.
after a while And it won't be very long You're gonna look for me And I will be gone I'm gonna walk around God's throne Walk on Walk on Just a little, Just a little while, while I'm telling you to walk on another amazing musical selection. Ladies and gentlemen, please direct your attention to the front of the room for Reflections of a Foot Soldier by a LOGS employee, Mr. Carl Stewart, and his father, Mr. Hugh L. Stewart. On March 7, 1965, 100 peaceful marchers crossed the Edmund Pettus Bridge, set to go to the state capitol in Montgomery, Alabama to protest the slaying of Jimmy Lee Jackson from Marion, Alabama, who was fatally murdered by a state trooper during a voters' rights rally in Marion, Alabama. Today I have with me my dad, who walked across that bridge during Bloody Sunday, as well as the march from Selma to Montgomery. And he's here to share his experience with you all and what he went through. He was 17 years old at the time a high school senior, a native of Marion, Alabama, and he too was there when Jimmy Lee Jackson was slain. So Pop, first question, how did you get involved in the movement? I'd like to say hello to everybody. Well, how I got involved in the movement, I was uh, in Marion, Alabama at Lincoln High School. I was a senior at the time. I was, uh, 17 years old, like Carl say. So at the time, it was for recess period, like a 10 o'clock break. And so at the time, we was outside, out on the campus, uh, Jesse Jackson and one of the Freedom Riders came up on the campus. And they asked 
to seniors and some juniors. We was, we was outside for break. They said, y'all, y'all not free. So I asked him, I said, what you mean we're not free? So he said, you don't have, your parents don't have the right to vote and you can't go to a restaurant, you can't go to the bathroom, you can't go to movie because you're not free. So I said, what you gonna do? He said, well, I'll tell you what you do. You follow me and we're gonna go to the city of Maryland, Alabama and we're gonna go up there and march around the city hall and y'all come go with me. So a bunch of us went, I think it was about two or 300 kids. So we left the campus and went to the city of Maryland, Alabama and we marched around the courthouse singing that we wanna be free and we shall overcome. That was the song back then. So after that, we came back to the school and the principal had the gates locked and had the bus lined up on the outside of the gates. And we had, they had the city troop or whatever, city police, and they put us on the bus. And I went to Camp 7. And so I went to different places like Greensboro, Alabama, and Thomasville, Alabama. And we, I went to Camp 7. So when I got to Camp Selma, when you come out the bus, each one of us come out the bus, the state troopers hit us in the side with a hot stick and call your name or any word. So they put us in a basement and Camp Selma was a prison at the time. So it was a concrete floor. We went in there and I stayed for like four days on concrete floor. And they had like a foot tub for everybody to drink water out of it in one cup, and the food wasn't fit to eat. So after the fourth day, my uh, leader from Maryland called Alba Turner Sr. He got us out of jail, I went back home, and he dropped me all back at home. So, I need to call, call me <laughs> You weren't supposed to say that. All right, so March 7th, 1965, Bloody Sunday, I didn't heard this message plenty of times, but let the people know what you went through on March 7, 1965 on Bloody Sunday. Okay, I'm, I'm gonna start back, I'm gonna go back before I get to March 7. What happened, I continued the mass meeting in Marion, Alabama, and the night we had uh, Reverend Vivian he was, speak, he was going to be the speaker there in Mary, Alabama at Zion Chapter Church. And he was talking about going out into the street for to uh, free a freedom rider down there in the city hall, I mean the jailhouse at the time. And he was talking about going out in the street and march to the jailhouse. So that night, when we come out of the church, they turn all the street lights out. And there's police and the troopers all lined up in front of us and they started beating the protest. So some of them ran back in the church like I did. I ran back in the church. Some of them went down side of the church and ran into a cafe called Mac Cafe. And that time, uh, Reverend Vivian, he had, to, he had to leave town in an ambulance because they were going to kill him. So they beat us up that night. So I went back home again. So how I got into March 7th for March 7th, Bloody Sunday, the march from Salem to Montgomery, they had another mass meeting and said we're going to march from Maryland, Alabama to Montgomery, I mean from Maryland to Montgomery. So they said, no, that's too far. So we got to go to Salem and meet with the, the marches down there at Salem at Brown Chapter Church. So we went down there and John Lewis, that Sunday, we're going to lead the march for us to go to from Salem to Montgomery. So when we got started, we left the church, went across the bridge on the other side. Nothing but horses, they troopers, lined up head facing us as we come off the bridge. So when we got on the other side of the bridge down there, they said, they told all the, the marshals by now for a word of prayer. And by that time, everybody got down on their knees. And that time they start throwing tear gas inside each person's head. And everybody started screaming and hollering, 
and falling out and running. I mean, the horse was running over people. They were whooping with the bull whip, billy club, everything. They like a smoke bone on the bridge. So my sister had got in the marsh that, that same day. And she was running towards the river. And a bunch of motor ran across the river. So I was trying to, get, to catch up from going to the river. And some motor get them back on top of the bridge. And when we got them back on top of the bridge, seemed like that's what they wanted. They just started running horses, beating you, beating you. And we finally got on the other side of the bridge, come back across. They was over there. So one of the horse had got up on me, so I just rushed up and grabbed him by the bit and turned away from me because I hold on to my sister. So I told you, run, run, now. I don't start running to get back to church. So we had to pick people up because they were bleeding. And when we got back to the church, they had the horses coming all the way back around to the church to throw a tear gas up at the window. And then we was inside, they were working on people that bleed and broke up or whatever. And after that, I went back home again, trying to recruit from the beating. <laughs> so I let Carl ask me another question here. Now, we know that there was an attempt to go to Montgomery uh, to protest Jimmy Lee Jackson. But you also started with Martin Luther King to go and march from Selma to Montgomery. But there was a turnaround at that point. He didn't, y'all didn't march. Y'all went to the end of the bridge and Martin Luther King decided, no, there's a trap, let's go. You probably all seen that in the movie Selma as well too. But tell us your experience when you went from Selma to Montgomery and what you saw, what you went through. Okay, when um, the, first, the second attempt to march the sale to Montgomery, uh, we, we uh, was there with Martin Luther King. He was leading the march, the second attempt. So he had told everybody before they left the church, if you scared, don't get in this march. So the one was scared, they got out and went back home. So we headed out from Brown Chapter to the, to the bridge. We got up on top of the bridge and Martin Luther King looked down there and said, oh, wait a minute, we ain't going no further. The lady got a trap. We're gonna turn around and go back to the church. So we turned around and went back to the church. So later on in the week, I guess he called up to the White House and talked to President Johnson and told him he needs some protection down there in Selma, Alabama to continue to march to Montgomery. So at that time, I guess he was trying to wind things up and get everybody up north to come down there with the food, the water, and nurses and uh, be ready to march third time for Selma to Montgomery. So in the meantime, when you was marching, tell us some of the things you saw. What, what, what did you see? People sleeping on the side of the roads. How did, how did you march? What, what did you have, the clothes on your back? Just tell us what you went through. Okay, the third time we left the church, we left out Brown Chapter and we went to the bridge and we went through. They had the Federal National Guards protecting us to continue our march from Selma to Montgomery. When I left home with the clothes on my back and my shoes, and we slept side the road, we used the bathroom side the road, we ate side the road. It was a struggle from there to, from Selma to Montgomery walking, you know that. So when I got to, Selma, to Montgomery, I didn't have no soul on my shoe. So I had to take my shoe strain and tie my soul onto my shoe so I could make it back home. And after that, then all the freedom riders that were with us, they were bring us back to our hometown and dropped us off. And I tell each and every one of you all today, whatever you do, vote. Because your vote do count. It don't matter who you vote for. But vote, because you can make a difference. 
And thank y'all for having me. But before he go, I also want to let everybody know, next week, my dad will be at the ceremony that Congresswoman Sue mentioned. So he will be attending that as well. Um, yeah, I, let, let me say, first of all, I'm a lot richer because I was here today. And I know you are as well. Um, so I certainly appreciate it from um, you know, my humble heart. Uh, and today was a very enriching experience for me, and uh, I certainly appreciate it. Thank you very much for coming today, each and every one of you. I think that uh, it was a remarkable event. And so I appreciate your participation. And I know that our team at LOGSA does as well. Thank you for all that supported this event, Clemmy. Um, it was wonderful. The food was wonderful. I will take some home with me tonight because my wife's out of town. <laughs> I got to eat. I'm trying to be six foot tall, and I, I'm w well beyond uh, doing that. And Congresswoman Sewell, thank you very much for your kind words, for your inspiration, for your passion, and for helping us today celebrate uh, what should be a year-long event. So thank you again from the bottom of my heart. Thank you from the LOGSA team, and I'll stop talking now. Thank you. I know this is totally off script, but sometimes you have to talk when the spirit fills your heart to do so. And even though uh, on behalf of my husband, who unfortunately is not able here to witness and partake of this wonderful, wonderful celebration and event, uh, I would be remiss if I didn't echo on his behalf my sincere appreciation to our elected officials, to Congressman Sewell, Congresswoman Sewell, who did a phenomenal job back in her hometown of Huntsville, as well as Selma. Uh, and I certainly wanted to, uh, to echo my appreciation to Mayor Trulock, to Colonel Lafredo, to you and your team. You were very humble in acknowledging the fact that it wasn't you, that it was, certainly was your team, but to all of you who are assembled, from the singing to the questioning to all of the hard work that went into planning an event of this magnitude, I thank you from the bottom of my heart. And as I was looking at the quilts that were on display there, I think that that, to me, is very symbolic of our wonderful Huntsville community. What a beautiful quilt it is that we come in so many different colors and patterns, but we can all come together and celebrate for the common good. So thanks to all of you in attendance as well. Ladies and gentlemen, this concludes our ceremony. Please stand and join along in the singing of the Negro National Anthem, Lift Every Voice and Sing. The words can be found in your program. We thank you all for your attendance. God bless our soldiers, civilians, and their families, and God bless the United States of America. Oh
Your 